don't, don't just shut up and watch okay. this. Because believe me, nothing you've seen prepares you for this. I'm Dan Carlson, one portion of the Lost Blokes. I am drinking Line and Kugel's Summer Shandy. Nice. Hi, I'm Dave Nesbitt. I am another uh, portion of the Lost Blokes. I am currently drinking a Zamboni, which is a blonde stout. What, what, and... what, is, the, uh, what is the creature on the logo? Oh, it looks kind of like a Jason Voorhees clone. Oh, let's see a little. Uh, is it okay to look at it a little more? Because it is Friday the thirteenth today. Yep, that's part of the reason I grabbed this. Oh, nice. And it's remarkably tasty. If you can find it, I recommend it. And okay. also, I have a uh, Jack and Coke as well because, well, you know, it's Friday. Right. Um, we uh, are reviewing a cursed films episode. Dedicated to Cannibal Holocaust. Yeah. Uh, have you seen the movie Cannibal Holocaust? Um, I've seen it in bits and pieces. It's one of those classics of things that you threw in the background of parties to freak people the fuck out. Oh, so you've never actually sat down and watched the whole movie? Never front to back, no. I know. Oh, I, I think I've seen enough of it to get the point across, but, you know. Um, it's one of those movies, kind of like uh, I watched a movie yesterday called The Sadness on Netflix. Oh, yeah, you were talking or about not that. Netflix, Netflix Shutter, Shutter, yeah. And it was, um, it's, it's, you know, they've been calling it the most disturbing zombie movie ever made. I'm like, how disturbing can a zombie movie be? Because how many different ways can you tear a person up, apart? Mm-hmm. Well, but, now you but, find out. But that's not what happens. There's, ah. that's, that's not, that happens. And it's gory as hell, but that's not why it's disturbing. There's all sorts of like, uh, if you took, I spit on your grave and mixed it with Day of the Dead you would have uh, this movie. So a uh, reason I bring it up is because, you know, um, it's one of those things where the people who like it are really going to like it, but you don't want to just randomly recommend it to just anybody. <laughs> Let's just say, you know, that there is a certain mindset that will absolutely appreciate this. And then there's another mindset that will call the police on you. Cursed Films, Cannibal Holocaust is the final episode of season two, I believe of Cursed Films season. Yeah. Um, and it is uh, uh, based around one of the most controversial movies ever made, Cannibal Holocaust, um, a film that was shot in the Amazon um, and structured to look lo- to, to appear to be found footage of a crew that had been uh, killed by cannibals. Um, the footage is presented as though it's real. Um, and half, you know, um, it, it basically has a... Um, surrounding story of this college professor who's shown this footage and he goes to, to the Amazon to, well, he goes to the Amazon to find the footage. He finds it, brings it back. They're watching it and they see that the crew uh, wasn't murdered by the cannibals. They were, um, they, they were the, they were the criminals that were trying to get the best footage possible. So they were starting shit with the various tribes and uh, very critical of the way the media kind of manipulates things. And then um, uh, when they realize this, you know, like the, the network is like, well, we still got to show it. It's great. But then he shows them the footage and it's fucking atrocious. (laughs) And they all walk out and say, burn it. (laughs) And that's the movie. Uh, The episode is really about all the things that went wrong during the filming. Um, the actors were were not given a a lot of the actors were not given a script until they got there, so they didn't know what they were in for. Um, there were there was there's footage of animals not being treated very well, <laughs> and then there's um, th- th- understatement of the year, and then um, that 
the way that the film is shot, it looks so realistic that a lot of, and, and, and Diodato caused a lot of problems for himself by making all the actors sign a contract saying they wouldn't appear in public for one year. Okay, I'm out of two minutes. But uh, he, what he did is he told all of his actors they couldn't make any public appearances for a year after they shot the film. And uh, as a result- One second. Yep. I think I said your timer off as well. This is the second week in a row that I've said. That was mine. Off. Yep. Yep. Okay. Continue. I apologize. Okay. I'll be back in frame in a moment. Okay. So um, one of the reasons Diodato got in trouble with this movie is because he uh, made the actors go into hiding for one year. They couldn't make any other movies. It's part of their contract. So um, rumors spread that it was a, their, the, that their deaths in the movie were real. So uh, he got arrested. He supposedly got arrested on murder charges and had to go to court to prove that he didn't kill them by making them come in and say, hey, I'm still alive. Yeah. Um, but apparently that is a myth, according to this show. Uh, that's probably an advertising myth. It probably never happened. I think there was I think he got in trouble. Uh, something to do with uh he got in trouble for something else that was unrelated to that. One of the things and that I saw was that it was basically more about the footage of animals being killed for real, which um, it was being prosecuted under the same old law that Italy had that outlawed um, uh, bullfighting. Bullfighting, yeah. So he was prosecuted under a bullfighting law. Yeah. Got like probation or something. And um, but you know they they wanted to sell movie tickets, so they spread this idea that he had to go to court to prove he wasn't a killer. Um, uh, this is one of the video nasties from the UK. Yep. And uh, of all the video nasties, a lot of them don't belong on the list, but this one definitely does. Oh yeah. <laughs> but uh, this but this is a movie that uh, it's 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 routinely put at number one or in the top five of most disturbing movies ever made and it's definitely got its moments in there i'll admit oh it's it's brutal it's brutal i didn't see it until 2003 it's one of those movies you have to uh you used to have to track down now um you can find it at barnes and noble which is really weird <laughs> it's weird for me because i've also seen um and i'm still amused that the uh that this film got that this film in question got a uh, criterion treatment, but I saw Salo with 120 Days of Sodom at Barnes and Noble, and I went, mm -hmm. you know, the world just gets a little bit odder every day. What we yeah. used to be the most shocking thing you can imagine is now considered to be an all-time classic. Yeah, um, it's. Uh, have you ever seen that movie? I haven't. Again, I've seen bits and pieces of it, and I've always been tempted to break down and buy a copy just so that way I could sit there and go, look, I have this fucked up piece of cinema, but yeah. somehow I can never bring myself to pull the trigger on it. Me, same here. I, I, I like, I, I, I enjoy watching fucked up stuff, but I, I do have my limits. <laughs> and I think I, the line is drawn right, right, right before that movie. Yeah. And to um, me, I think it's like a lot of the people thinking of that in relation to Cannibal Holocaust, I think a lot of it is it's something that you put on as kind of like a background to an event sort of thing. Why would that more... show it? In the <laughs> oh, no, I mean like a party or something like that. Cause no. I, remember pl I remember plenty of, of college parties that I would attend or parties with some of my more unusual friends where they would have horror films playing in the background and cannibal Holocaust would always be going, uh, which by the way not... is a hell of a thing to have going when you're wandering around with a head full of LSD. I'm just saying, wow. Yeah. I, I would not be brave enough to show this at a party. I would, you know, show up like maybe two or three people who I knew would like it. Uh, I mean, I've got I do, I, I'm, wondering if, I'm wondering if uh, a lot of people, because there's a movie very like this, but it's a lot less extreme called uh, Cannibal Ferox. Yep. Make Them Die Slowly is the American title. And it's actually worse than, it's actually more intense than Cannibal Holocaust as, in terms of what happens. Yep. But because of the way it's shot, it's shot like a, a Hollywood movie, you know, like with production and everything. So it's less disturbing than this is because this feels like a piece of evidence that leaked out from a murder trial. 
And to me, I think that that's something that there, I was, had, I had this conversation in a sociology class a few years ago, where mm -hmm. I talked about that there's kind of a, a social contract written into the way that things are shot. Mm -hmm. And that hint of 16 millimeter grain, shaky cam, and, um, you know, kind of messed up audio is something that cues the backs of our, the back of our brain to go, oh, wait, this is real. Mm -hmm. And we're like, we've, we've all been watching the news long enough. And those of us who are old enough to have watched the news back in the seventies and such, where it really literally was 16 millimeter footage. Yeah. The Vietnam footage was all shot like this. Yeah. It was all kind of, it, it's basically something that if you see something like that, your brain automatically gives it a certain value of it being more real and closer to reality than anything else. Mm -hmm. um, th that's the, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's a weird movie because it's extremely well made, but at the same time, it's, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? It's uh, you can't, you can't, you can't call it, you can't call it good. Because it's it, because it, it's 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 too disreputable, but it's it's way better than it than it has any right to be. Yeah, and from the shooting style and the way that it's put together, I really have to give a lot of respect to D'Addario for actually like nailing that whole thing down. Mm -hmm. um, and I think part of the reason that it tends to have a bit more of a reputation is that it is more about the substance around the violence and. It's kind of like that mixture of, and they mention, we can get into a bit more of this later, but they mention mm -hmm. the similarities between it and Blair, Blair Witch Project. Mm -hmm. And also it has a feeling and it has a feeling very similar to something like um, a Heart of Darkness, uh, which would eventually be translated into Apocalypse Now. The further you get into this whole situation, the farther into madness that you're going. And at what point do you decide to join it? And what point do you run from it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and the comparison to Apocalypse Now is apt because that movie has a scene where a buffalo is slaughtered. Yeah, for real. Um, but I know that uh, from what I from what I understand, Francis Ford Coppola said he, he and his crew had nothing to do with actually killing that buffalo. It was going to be killed anyway for food that night, and they just happened to film it. Yeah, um, at that point, it's more a matter of if you know if the people in the local area were going to do it. Well, now you have something that you can document. Mm -hmm. And that was well, the, or, oh, sorry, go ahead. I mean, you know, give or take, there's a certain amount of Hollywood reality involved in this too. So you can kind of make up your own mind on that one. Yeah. Um, so this was made uh, as a reaction or um, to um, the earlier late sixties and seventies movies, the Mondo films. Yes. Uh, Mondo Kane in particular uh, stuff that Jacob Petty made. And, you know, those were very, kind of um uh xenophobic uh portraits of other countries yeah. in at a time when people didn't get to travel much so they just had, had kind of had to take the filmmaker at their word yeah you know. yeah there's a there is a subtext to these kind of film i shouldn't say subtext it's kind of across the top of encountering the barbarians in their own environment it's got a real racist feel to it in a lot mm -hmm. of respects yeah um the pro um it, it's, it's what puts this movie in a weird place is that it's both doing that and criticizing it at the same time. Yes. And I think that that's, you know, it's part of another part of the reason that this film has such a reputation to it is that it really does um, both play the role and criticize the role and tries to have it both have it both ways. Because mm -hmm. like we're being critical of you stepping in and making these comments about this society. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, well, you know, it's all in the script anyway, and we're pretty much doing the thing and all. Yeah, it's just, yeah. Yeah. So it's like, um, it's like one, you know, it's, 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 that's why it's a weird, if it were in better hands, it like if an Oliver Stone had made it or something like that, it might've, it, it might've might worked better. And, you know, like if you got rid of all of the animal stuff and everything, yeah. Um, but because it's kind of played more for shock it, it doesn't all of its all of its justifications for existing kind of um become difficult to uh put Maintain. forth as yeah so it's a weird it's a weird thing that where you're watching it and you're kind of like really um fascinated by what you're seeing but also um 
yeah, it's not work. You know, it, it's not it's not what it claims to be. It's not what it's trying to be. Are yeah, you... and I think I, I think that that's part of the reason. Another part of the reason is that they're kind of using that sense of criticism as a shroud to hide all of the other shit that they're doing, mm -hmm. or to at least be a shock absorber for it. And I just don't see it landing that well. It more or less comes across as um, a fake concern. And that's kind of what bothers me. Um, well, uh, I think you do have to watch it all the way through to, to really grasp, you know, like, I mean, you can grasp the idea, like what you said, but I think until you watch it all the way through, um, there's a couple of movies where like right at the end, uh, the kind of movie that makes you aware of how quiet the room is when it's over. Yeah. Um, Girl Next Door would be one for me. Uh, oh, Martyr, Jesus Christ. Yeah. Martyrs and this yeah. one. You know, like as soon as it's over you're like oh shit <laughs> well i think that that's part of the thing is that there's real again this is something that gets horror films into a lot of trouble when they do it is there's real substance you to the killing that goes on there hmm. um that you know that that it actually genuinely has moments of affecting you mm -hmm. and as opposed to say and i was just i was thinking about this again yesterday as opposed to action films that, you know, hey, we just killed off 200 anonymous mooks. Who cares? Mm -hmm. But this this somehow the violence in this affects you in a far deeper and much more primal and emotional level. Well, it's not it's not so much spectacle as much as it is that there's substance. I feel like I also feel like and not not, I'm, not that I'm defending Diodato, but I also feel like when you're writing something, there's almost Craven was saying that writing Last House on the Left was a lot of fun making it and seeing people watch it is a different story oh you know? yeah because when you're just writing words down on a piece of paper it's like oh this will be interesting you know but when you're doing it <laughs> in it's front of yeah, the camera it's some, yeah that film goes way way darker uh, than than you would expect and i think this film in its own rather unique way does too you're kind of expecting a piece of um exploitation cheese and mm -hmm. yeah, there's some of that to it, but again, there's something, there's a lot more depth and texture to it. And it really does tend to hit you in the, in the emotions. It, it, it is intelligent in a lot of ways. I mean, um... I mean, I, yeah. And that's, I, this is one of those things that has its feet with one side in the lowbrow world and another foot in the highbrow world. Mm -hmm. and I think that that's what kind of creates a sort of like dissonance for viewers. Yeah. It's, it's weird to me that like, um, I, you know, I kind of hinted at it earlier, but like this, this was a movie that I, I read about in like 1988 in, in Gore Zone or something like Chaz Ballin. And he would just talk about how it was the most extreme thing he'd ever seen. And he's seen everything. So I'm just like, well, I got to see this. I looked for it for years and I couldn't find it. And then now it's like, you know, everybody's seen it. <laughs> yeah. The explosion of both streaming and DVDs and everything else. And all of us basically kind of like going, all right, who cares about a rating system? <laughs> yeah, that, that's another thing too. Back then, um, you know, getting an unrated cut of anything like Dead Alive would be a, a get, you know, you would get home and get excited. Now, unrated stuff is in Walmart. Um, but the episode doesn't really go into anything that you wouldn't see on uh, the bonus features of like the Grindhouse releasing disc. Yeah, they interview the same people. Um, it's weird seeing Francesca Cardi talk about how you know, like she hates the movie, but at the same time, on the Blu-ray, I'm seeing her doing tours of, uh, yeah, you know, like like she's she's doing conventions and stuff and smiling and laughing. So hey, you know, I think she hates the movie, but I think that it's become something that um, her notoriety allows her an opportunity to make a pretty decent living off of it. So that's, it's kind of a weird relationship. That, it's got to be a weird situation where the one thing that can make you money is the one thing that keeps you from getting any other work. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a strange uh, catch 22 that a lot of them found themselves. So Quentin Tarantino calls Cannibal Holocaust the best directed horror movie of the eighties. Um, I would differ, but okay. I think it's well direct. I think uh, it's, it's, it's one of those things where it's a horrible situation where he, like with Kubrick and the shining and the way he treated. There's a Duval. lot of head gaming them in there. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, like it's a situation where you don't want to like say anything nice about him because he, he was crossing so many lines, but in terms of what the, the film, the way the film looks and how it's structured and how well it 
turned out, I mean, aside from the obvious, it's a very problematic movie, but yeah. aside, aside from that, I mean, in terms of the actual structure of it, it is pretty well directed. But I think that, and it's something they went into very early on in the episode is that Italy at that point in time, and really still is known for doing horror films in a particularly extreme fashion. So you're going to do gore, you're going to go all, all in it's, on gore. It's the only, it's the, they, they kind of alluded to the fact that it was, it's really the only purely Italian genre because everything else that was sort of like their take on an American genre or French or whatever, but this this um ca the cannibal film was uniquely italian yeah the cannibal film was definitely something where they could go and it it has that feel uh the the comparisons i kept making to myself as i was thinking of it was um the only real things i can think of is like old old school like you know pre-christian greek theater and the romans did this too mm -hmm where they would have prisoners come out and they'd be the special effects. Mm. <clears throat> um, the only other comparison I can make is similar to the Grand Guillon mm. in uh, Paris, yeah. where it was like, you know, extreme to the point of going past the point of horror and well into violence, where, or not into violence, but into humor. Mm. Um, well, and yeah, I think that I, this film comes dangerously close to it a few times, but there's still something in the substance of this film that keeps it from teetering over into self-parody. It never turns into humor. I'll, I mean, like, yeah, if you make something violent, if th there's a certain level of blood in the scene to make it disturbing. And once you go beyond that, it becomes like funny. Yeah. That's why like, you know, like those of us who like splatter movies, a lot of times we're laughing at them, you know, cause it's just like, come on, that's ridiculous amount of blood. There's more, that's more blood than could come out of a human body, you know? Yes. <laughs> But uh, this movie, I don't think there was a single laugh in it. I didn't find anything funny. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, th this film does not lend itself to a whole big bucket of laughs. Uh, although I will say that the uh, theme song is beautiful and is used at weddings a lot of times, <laughs> which is really weird. <laughs> Got a week of vacation So I decided to go somewhere No one else has gone before Cannibal vacation Cannibal vacation The last one to eat dinner Is the last one alive Cannibal vacation Cannibal vacation your friends and eat your own parents, eat your dog and eat your own toes and shit because it's cannibal vacation. Cannibal vacation. Eat the boat guy, the guy who drives the boat. Eat the guys that save you when it won't float. It's a cannibal vacation. Cannibal vacation. What do you eat when everyone else has already been eaten on a cannibal vacation? Cannibal vacation. Woo! Cannibal vacation. John, I want this material burned, all of it.